In September 1944, British airborne forces tackled the most difficult part of an airborne operation, to take and hold the bridges of the Rhine near Arnhem. But the effort failed, despite the heroic efforts of the British 1st Airborne Division. American airborne forces were also heavily involved in the Normandy and Arnhem operations. The two Allied nations also cooperated in the airborne crossing of the Rhine. After World War II, the primary paratrooper aircraft of the Royal Air Force was the Hastings. The Hastings was a four-engined aircraft that saw considerable operational service in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Middle East. In the mid-1950s, the Hastings was replaced by the Beverly, an aircraft specially designed for the delivery of paratroopers and heavy army equipment. On board, the paratroopers were situated in a boom supporting the tail unit above and behind the cavernous main cabin. This cabin had removable rear doors and in this form could release substantial amounts of cargo such as vehicles and artillery. A more modern transport used for the whole gambit of airlift tasks was the Argosy. This aircraft entered service in the early 1960s. It was smaller but faster and had a greater range than the Beverly. Its central pod between the two booms carrying the tail unit had doors that could be opened for the release of paratroopers or equipment. Heavier items could be dropped from medium altitudes with clusters of parachutes, or at very low altitudes by a means of a retarding parachute. The retarding parachute pulled cargo from the hold and then braked to a halt only a few feet above the ground, allowing the cargo to impact the ground relatively lightly. The key element in the Argus's success was the accuracy with which it could deliver its payloads. In the period after World War II, the Soviets took the lead in the development of a large airborne force. Soviet airborne forces tied in closely with their doctrine of fast-moving offensives, which were spearheaded by their tank divisions. Delivered by aircraft and helicopters, Soviet airborne elements had the task of seizing and holding key points and destroying or disrupting the enemy's lines of communication prior to the arrival of the spearhead forces. The latter was the responsibility largely of the Spetsnaz, an elite force within an elite force. It was also tasked with related roles, such as the assassination of the enemy's political and military leaders. In the mid-1970s, the army adopted a British helicopter, the Lynx, as its standard light battlefield helicopter. Fast and agile, the Lynx can be operated in a number of tactical tasks. Perhaps the most important of these is the anti-tank role. The Lynx is operated by a crew of two and armed with up to eight heavyweight tow missiles. These missiles are each capable of destroying a main battle tank after being guided to impact by means of a roof-mounted site. The Army's Lynx, which can be distinguished from its naval counterpart by its use of twin-skid landing gear rather than a wheeled tricycle arrangement, could also deliver up to 12 troops carried in the cabin behind the two-man crew. The cabin can also be used for the carriage of a light freight load, and a tactically useful alternative is a heavier freight load carried by a hook to the fuselage. Another of the Lynx's capabilities is the insertion of specialized teams of ground troops, most notably anti-tank missile teams, complete with their launcher, 
and a number of reload missiles. This provides an excellent capability for the ambush of armoured spearhead units. The other side of this coin is the protection of one's own forces from enemy attack, both surface and airborne. Here, the British Army's most capable battlefield system is the track rapier. The system is made up of a modified light-armoured vehicle which carries the target acquisition system, control system and a launcher with up to eight rapier surface-to-air missiles. Small and agile, these missiles are guided with an accuracy so great that they carry only a small warhead. The majority of their destructive effect comes from their high energy impact to target aircraft. The Puma is a larger battlefield helicopter of French design and is used for the tactical air mobility role. The Puma can carry freight either internally or externally and its cabin can be used for the accommodation of up to 20 troops. Helicopters such as the Lynx and Puma can also be used for the movement of anti-aircraft teams. Equipped with shoulder-launched missiles, these teams provide battlefield forces, both armoured and infantry, with protection against the low-altitude attacks of the enemy's anti-tank and close-support aircraft, both fixed-wing and rotary-link types. The first British shoulder-launched surface-to-air missile, or SAM, was the blowpipe. This was succeeded by the Javelin, and then by the Star Streak. The missile was popped out of its launcher tube by a small booster charge. Its own sustainer motor ignites only after the missile has cleared the immediate area, after which it accelerates to supersonic speed. The operator guides the missile to the target by means of an optical system using a small thumb-controlled joystick to generate steering commands. The Puma's naval counterpart in the assault delivery of Royal Marine Commandos is the Sea King HC Mark IV. This is the Navy's version of a commando land-based tactical transport helicopter with fixed landing gear. In service with the Royal Navy, the Sea King HC Mark IV can operate under any climatic conditions, from the steaming jungle to the ice-cold Arctic. It's used with the movement of up to 28 troops or freight items carried internally or as externally slung loads. Another helicopter designed specifically for naval use is the Sea King HAS, or Helicopter Anti-Submarine. The Sea King HAS is based on the standard Sea King, but its main landing gear units are retracted into stabilizing sponsons. It has an advanced tactical system drawing on radar and sonar data and can undertake a wholly autonomous anti-submarine or anti-ship mission with armament that includes anti-ship missiles, anti-submarine torpedoes and depth charges. The Sea King was replaced in 1999 in its primary role by the Merlin, a larger three rather than two engine helicopter of Anglo-Italian design and manufacture. Despite its size, the Merlin can operate from helicopter platforms of relatively small warships. Although the Merlin can also perform in the transport role, it's used for the anti-submarine and anti-ship roles. For this, it's fitted with a more advanced tactical system than the Sea King, but uses the same armament. The usefulness of the large aircraft carriers in the British Armed Services reached its peak in 1982. This marked the arrival of the new, smaller carriers of the Invincible class. 
these aircraft carriers were partnered with larger and considerably older Hermes carriers in the operation to recover the Falkland Islands from Argentine occupation. Without these two carriers, the operation would have been impossible. Carriers first provided the tactical air power essential to cover the arrival and pre-landing operations of the Naval Task Force. They then covered the troop landings and the development of lodgings while waiting for the establishment of an improvised airstrip for land-based aircraft. In combination with the two aircraft carriers from where it operated, the Sea Harrier was the weapon that made the British recapture of the Falkland Islands possible. The British task force was faced with all of the adverse effects of operating away from its own home base while fighting an enemy that was working close to its domestic base. British forces also faced conditions that suggested that Argentine air power was superior in both numbers and to a certain degree in quality, as many Argentine warplanes were supersonic. Three advantages enjoyed by the British were the facts that the Argentines were operating at the limit of their range. The Sea Harrier was an excellent warplane with better weapons than its adversaries and the British pilots had received far superior training than their opponents. The Argentines' warplanes were severely limited in range and endurance and flew at supersonic speed. In combination with the British advantages, the pilots of the Sea Harrier Force were able to gain and maintain air superiority over the task force and the Falklands. However, the Argentine pilots were sometimes able to puncture the overall British air superiority that resulted in the loss of several ships. The British were able to cover their task force and the ground force landing in a subsequent advance on Port Stanley. In these later stages, the Sea Harrier operated in the close support role, proving itself as effective at ground attack as it was at air combat. Three light carriers of the Invincible class were originally designed and built in spite of, rather than with the support of the Treasury, and for political reasons were therefore called through-deck cruisers. In reality, this was a subterfuge designed to obscure the fact that the ships were in fact helicopter carriers with the task of hunting and, if necessary, destroying Soviet nuclear-part submarines in the North Atlantic.